We're going to uh, get started, so if everyone would uh, please take their seats. And first off, I wanted to thank you for uh, coming out to our uh, 3 p.m. program today. If, uh, if you ever can't make the 3 p.m. program, we all also have a 7 p.m. program. So before I get introduced the speaker, I'll go over a couple of news items. I'll work from the, uh, on the back is a list of our upcoming speakers. Um, our original speaker who was supposed to speak today is speaking at 7 p.m. next month, Colonel Ernest Brod. So, uh, I apologize for the uh, scheduling mishaps and conflicts. Uh, many of our speakers have uh, a lot of uh, medical appointments, as you may understand. So uh, occasionally they have to cancel last minute, and uh, I have to say okay. I can't say no. So uh, we have uh, a speaker that's coming here to uh, share a book that she published about uh, growing up in Belgium and becoming uh, part of the Belgian resistance during World War II. And she lives in Gwinnett. Her name is Fernand Davis. And then uh, Ray Martinez lives in Hatboro. He's going to share his uh, combat experiences in North Africa and Italy, the 540 days of combat. He served as an infantryman. And then uh, Gordon Myers from Levittown, PA. He's got a pretty uh, interesting program about plays that he put on in World War II called G.I. Carmen, while also serving as an infantryman in Europe. So, yeah. Peter Rossetti of Southampton, PA, will be talking about his time in the Navy aboard an LST. Uh, Peter was uh, wounded uh, in, Norman in the uh, English Channel following the uh, invasion of Normandy, and he's going to share his story. And then last but not least, Joe Soli of pa Paoli, PA, who was an infantryman in Europe that was uh, captured and kept a diary, so he's going to come and share his uh, diary that he kept with us. So uh, again, uh, I apologize for the uh, scheduling this app. So uh, we're going to try to um, put out the press release the week before the program. That way we don't have any, um, in the past we've had people come here that uh, have been upset, expected to see someone else speak, so again, apologize. Uh, this coming, about two or three weeks from now, we're, ha we're uh, helping out the homeless veterans. It's, this has been running for 13 years now, uh, annually. It's called the Homeless Veterans Stand Down 2008. It's at the bottom of your newsletter and we're looking for volunteers to help run that. And basically what they do is help homeless veterans find employment, find shelter. If they're not enrolled in the VA, we enroll them in the VA. Uh, if they need any legal help, we have attorneys there. And these are all volunteers. So uh, I'll be uh, helping with security. That's, that's what I'm volunteering for. So they, we could put you to work serving food, uh, it's going to be an overnight program, so there are going to be overnight shifts for these for these uh, two days and three nights. Excuse me, two nights and three days. Uh, so if you're interested, the phone number is on the bottom, and uh, you know, and it's run by volunteers just like this program. So without the volunteers, it, it can't, it wouldn't, it wouldn't last. Uh, the second from the bottom is the World War II Lecture Institute. Now has. Uh, five lecture series. This is uh, one of the five, the Abington program. The other ones uh, on here are the 8th Air Force Historical Society. They meet, they meet about uh, once every, once a month or once every two months at the Williamson's Restaurant in Horsham. It's a pretty good program. It's a, it's a more of a formal program. They have a, they have a lunch. And the uh, coordinator's number is on there. So if you're interested in participating in that program, they have uh, guest speakers, just like we do here, and it's a pretty nice program. That's why, I, and uh, Chris Boswell is the reason why we had our 10-year anniversary dinner there at Williamson's Restaurant. Uh, Capital. This is uh, probably what, about two hours from here. The Capital Area World War II Roundtable is in Hershey. Uh, that started because of this program here. 
the man that runs it's a Vietnam, Vietnam veteran, Bill Jackson. Our Doylestown World War II Lecture Series is still running the fourth Wednesday of each month. That's probably the closest one to here. Uh, it's, in, it's at the Bucks County Library in Doylestown. And then uh, our Westchester University Lecture Series. We do this about twice a year, a uh, World War II program at Westchester University for the students. And besides these lecture series, we also have, uh, if you go up to the next news item, the, some of the volunteer positions needed. We have a Veterans in the Classroom project. We speak at four high schools in the area, Upper Moreland, Springfield, Abington, and Upper Dublin. So the positions we need here, we also run a children's lecture series down on this floor. With uh, This is the children's floor of the library. So if you're interested in helping out with the children's lecture series, we could use your help. I need help. <laughs> I think everyone here needs help. And phone callers to try to boost our attendance. We, on average, we've had about 46 in the afternoon and 46 in the evening. I think uh, at one time, a couple years ago, this, this room used to be full. And uh, our, our donations, which uh, help keep the program running, uh, have fallen off because of the attendance. So, and uh, other uh, opportunities. If you know any, uh, trying to get more. Uh, no offense to the older generation, we're trying to get more uh, young kids interested in here, helping out. So, uh, kids that are that can uh, help with our website and help with video, the videotaping. So, if you know any uh, kids in the area, please uh, get them involved. And uh, George Stiftinger, who usually reads our invocation, uh, just got out of the hospital. I talked to him, he's, he's, he's doing okay, he's a little medicated, so he couldn't make it today, but, but uh, he'll be back next month, he guaranteed me. So, I'm going to read the invocation, we'll stand for the pledge, and then, uh, and then we'll uh, introduce our guest speaker, so first pledge of allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And since George uh, Stiffinger is not here today, I did choose a poem. So I chose a uh, poem written from a viewpoint of an Army Air Corps veteran, World War II veteran. I first uh, was introduced to this poem in high school by my English teacher, and it's called The uh, Death of a Ball Turret Gunner by Randall Jarrell. It's from my mother's sleep I fell into the state, and I hunched in its belly till my wet fur froze. Six miles from earth, lucid from the dream of life, I woke to black flack and the nightmare fighters. When I died, they washed me out of the turret with a hose. So, it's a pretty powerful poem. Without any further ado, the war experiences of Arthur Dredger of Bluebell, Pennsylvania. I have to thank Art. He uh, filled in last minute. And so uh, thank him for coming from Bluebell. <laughs> also, uh, Art brought a bunch of stuff in the back of the room, which I'm going to pass around while he speaks. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much, Brandon. Can you all hear me? Yeah. OK, good. Uh, First place, uh, Brandon called me yesterday about noontime, I guess it was, and asked if I'd do this, and I said I'd be willing to. So <laughs> I'm just about unprepared as can be. Now, in the back of the room, uh, I have two things there. Uh, one is a uh, short snutter collection, and a short snutter uh, is a collection of money. Since it was an element of gambling, and you had to fly across an ocean, and I did from uh, California, to the Pacific, I uh, uh, and there was an element of gambling, and since uh, it was quite common then for people to fly across the ocean, I did become a short snorter. However, I did make a collection of money, and here it is. Here, I had friends in Europe that I met in the radio school, and uh, I would send them money from the Pacific, and they in turn would send me money from the uh, European. Here's some uh, Filipino guerrilla money. Each island in the Philippines had its own guerrilla army, and uh, they printed their own money, and uh, here it is here. 
Oh, on certain flights I had uh, Lieutenant Hopkins, Davenport, McGuire, these are famous men. And here's V for Victory. And uh, at any rate, you, you can uh, look through here. Uh, here's uh, other Philippine guerrilla money from the various islands. Here's a Dutch gilder. A Dutch gilder is what we were paid for uh, in uh, New Guinea. It's worth 53 cents. A carton, a carton of cigarettes cost 53 cents, or uh, one gilder. Uh, here's Japanese money, which is very colorful. Uh, uh, at any rate, you can take a look at this. Uh, here is uh, on Valentine's Day. I was on a gorilla field, and we had a flat tire, so we had to stay overnight. And they killed a caribou for us, and we had fresh meat. And uh, the people signed our bills here, and uh, and uh, etc. 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 So you can look through this at your leisure at the uh, end of the period. Uh, a lady at church. <laughs> She kept <clears throat> she kept a a, a record of the World War II uh, cartoon, and uh, I have them here. Uh, a lot of these you don't understand because you have to bring a certain amount of knowledge to a cartoon to understand it. If you don't know who John L. Lewis was, you you miss out half of these. But at any rate, uh, some of them are pretty good. And uh, and uh, here's a Ford Museum and. Uh, so I'll pass these around, and uh, the, the, uh, one, there's a couple in here that are very good. I don't know who they are right now. But the point is, there's one that is December 6, 1941, the day before Pearl Harbor. And it shows you uh, uh, <coughs> Japan going invading Thailand, or Siam. And uh, if, uh, if they invade, then China, America, the Dutch, and the British will fall on top of them and crush them. And you know who got crushed the next day. So uh, there's the cartoons back there. You can look at them. OK, I was raised in northeast Philadelphia uh, by, and Tacone, by the Tacone from our bridge. I remember when they built the bridge. My father used to get down there Sunday afternoon to make sure they were doing it right. Uh, at any rate, uh, so uh, I was raised in northeast Philadelphia. Uh, I was a very bashful boy. My father was from Germany, and from World War II, uh, from World War I, uh, there was a uh, feeling of uh, anti-German feeling. So I was a very, very bashful boy uh, in, uh, in school. Uh, as the, uh, here's a picture of my house in Tacony, and my mother, and my sisters, and my father. Yeah. Um, and then. Uh, during the 1930s, uh, it was a feeling, uh, okay, you can pass it now. There was a feeling that we had made a mistake by getting the one involved in World War I. Uh, 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 I read Warner Millis, The Age of Hate, etc., etc., etc. And uh, so during the mid 30s, there was a neutrality legislation passed, uh, which would make it difficult for us to get to the war. Uh, Colonel House and Woodrow Wilson and all these other propaganda uh, things that got us involved in World War I. Well, Roosevelt signed them, but he did it reluctantly about 1935. If these bills had remained, if these laws had remained on the books, we would have not have gotten involved in World War II. However, they were gradually repealed, and one could see, one could see gradually how we were getting involved in World War II. Uh, I was an isolationist. I was not opposed uh, to a rearmament, but I, was, uh, I felt that every gun, every shell, every tank should remain on American soil uh, and not be sent overseas, but so may it be. The, um, the, uh, me. the uh, on Memorial Day, we saw the uh, soldiers from World War I marching in the parades. And then at the end of each parade, there was a bunch of old men. And they were out of step. They were wore funny uniforms. They were covered with medals. Uh, they all carried canes. They all had beards. And my mother explained to my sisters and myself that these were men of the Civil War. And uh, I, uh, one day, and my mother told me always to wave at the man on the porch across the street in the next block, which we did 
One day he invited us up. And my mother insisted that my sister and I shake hands with this man. I don't know, uh, I didn't know why, I didn't know the significance of it, but I do remember the first time I saw soldiers was when he died and the army came down the street for a military funeral. So that was, uh, that's it. So I maintain that these uh, feelings here, these um, records here, in another 10 years or so will be similar to the Civil War diaries. And uh, so I gave, made sure that my children got a copy of them. Um, I started writing these up about 1997, 1998, and I started. And I, I wrote them up in isolated things, and later I joined them together. Uh, at any rate, uh, we got involved in World War uh, II. It seems that uh, it seems that. Uh, <coughs> I was going to night school. The uh, I was going to night school, uh, and I would do my homework listening to the radio on Sunday afternoon to bell telephone hour, the Prudential hour, and uh, one afternoon one of the men said, "Unless buy war bonds so we can return to the Japanese, what they did to us this morning at Pearl Harbor, what did they do?" Well, they soon came out. And I was mad because I just felt that uh, here we were going into uh, uh, into this uh, war. Um, the uh, the uh, the uh, when we got into the war, I hope I was taking a course in business law, and I hoped that I would have a chance to uh, to finish it. I did finish it, uh, and uh, then uh, I did. Show my draft number coming up, so I uh, uh, realized that if you uh, enlisted, you would have your choice of service. Our first choice was a Navy, because if we were going to lose our lives, at least we'd be sleeping in the sheets the night before. However, uh, and some of my boyfriends and scouts, they enlisted in the uh, Army Air Corps, and so I did the same thing. Uh, I went down in uh, May or June to the uh, customs house, and I realized they had to stand up and raise their right hand. And I thought, wait a minute, I came down for information, and I'm not going to enlist now. But I did in July, so on July 9th, I enlisted in the Air Corps. Since there were shortage of uh, facilities for training pilots, uh, I was told to go home and I'd be called up. Well, it was six months from July 9th to January 10th of the following year. In the meantime, the invasion of Guadalcanal took place. The invasion of North Africa took place. People were wondering why, how come I was uh, still home. Since uh, we had enlisted two weeks apart, I know when those other guys were called up that I would, uh, uh, that I would be called up soon. At any rate, I went to the Air Corps and uh, uh, to the primary in, uh, in uh, uh, San Antonio, San Antonio Aviation Cadet Center. Uh, there we were uh, given our... Okay, please, Anna Straylight, please come to the circulation desk. Thank uh, you. Uh, there we were given uh, our uh, early training and uh, uh, upper freshman, under freshman. Uh, as an under freshman, I did quite well. In fact, uh, I didn't receive any gigs. Uh, there was a fellow from New York, Pennsylvania. Uh, we took care of one another. He saw to it that my locker was in perfect condition. I saw it that he was in perfect condition. And uh, one day, uh, after we finished our basic training, here one of the fellows said, hey, you got something on your back. So I went to the hospital. I reported a sick hall, and here I had German measles. So uh, I went to uh, the hospital for German measles. And, uh, and I was, in the meantime, I was supposed to be SOD, senior officer of the day. Holy smokes, same brown belt, swords, and this and that and everything else. Just built that way. So I got out of that by being in the hospital. The, uh, at any rate, uh, uh, so uh, after uh, pre-flight, we were sent to primary in uh, Vernon, Texas. I can't remember the train ride from Vernon, Texas on up to uh, uh, from San Antonio. But I do know that uh, uh, we were, there were 
was four of us assigned to an instructor. Uh, and uh, well, I was the only one that had ever flown an airplane before. In fact, I was the only one that had not driven a car before because I was a bachelor boy. And I didn't, uh, my father had me take get a license, but I never drove. And um, the instructor I went up with at last, and uh, boy, he did he use powerful language. Of course, he always said, uh, he didn't curse the pilot out, he cursed the plane out. Of course, the plane understood it, but that was just said. But boy, that language was uh, pretty, pretty, pretty severe. Uh, at any rate, I did pretty good. Uh, I, uh, there was four of us, he was supposed to wash out two, and finish two. And so every instructor was supposed to wash out two, and finish two. Well, first thing you know, my, two of my classmates uh, washed out, and Dubs and I were supposed to finish. I couldn't believe it. So, uh, uh, I, uh, George Bradley, in the meantime, an old Boy Scout buddy, he had gone into a spin and he failed to pull out and he died. And I thought I could let, him let my parents go through what he went through, and uh, or what their parents went through, his parents went through. Uh, we hitchhiked all over, and, and that was just it. Um, the uh, uh, the uh, at any rate, he came in one morning and he said, "I got some bad news for you." He says, "I'm supposed to teach you night flying, and uh, uh, we had uh, flares last night." And I'm colorblind, so I have to hand you over to uh, the instructors. Well, 71 percent of our flags rushed out, so I'm 69 percent. So I'm the third man, or the man who already washed out his two. Well, guess who's going to get the net? Well, uh, that was it. He found uh, uh, in the first place. My instructor had us fly from the front seat. Uh, all others had us fly from the rear seat, uh, and uh, he found an excuse for me to take a test flight, I made an habitation error, so I washed out, and that was it. Uh, my um, feelings of inferiority then showed up. Uh, here, I was the only one that washed out that was supposed to go to navigation school. Uh, my mathematical skills are about six feet underground, but I did pretty good in vectors, and, uh, and they had to change my order. So here, my chance to become a navigator and an officer and lead a good life, I just washed away. So in the meantime, I continued to go to classes that everyone was surprised. I was supposed to stay in the back, in the barracks, and everyone was surprised. I continued. I learned a lot about weather, etc., etc., etc. I, uh, I uh, did my spins, my stalls. Uh, I, I frankly, I have about 33 hours of uh, flying time. I have them recorded right here. Uh, uh, right here. Well, we fellows that were washed out were sent 50 miles to Wichita Falls and Shepherd Field. I know they had a cow pasture that didn't see a speck of dirt. Uh, it was nothing but dust. It was, that was it. The, uh, we uh, washed out gadgets, you know, our, our cadets were reduced from $75 a month down to $50 a month. And uh, here are these other guys came in. They were sweaty, they were dirty, they were glad to see us, and oh, boy, what a, what a life. Uh, at any rate, uh, the, uh, the cadets were a great hire. We marched better, we marched a little better than the typical person, and the result is we were given a speed up, basic training, instead of taking 60 or 70 days, we did it in 30 days. And these other guys were left behind. So I was sent to Sioux Falls, South Dakota, now, before the war, I was a uh, shipper, and I knew the railroads in the country pretty good at that time. And so I knew from the railroads that we were taking, we were heading for Sioux Falls, South Dakota, uh, which was a uh, five months, five and a half months um, radio school. Uh, I had a thorn in my, from a cactus plant in my spine on the way up, and so I reported on sick call, and uh, I was put in the hospital right away. And I stayed there for a month. So all the guys in my barracks were uh, in one class, and I and another fellow were in another place. So they had their days off on Wednesday. I had my days off on Thursdays. Um, the uh, the uh, Sioux Falls was a nice town. 
I uh, learned how to bake there, a pint of upside down cake, and I uh, had a very, very nice uh, time in Sioux Falls. We learned about radio operating. Uh, we had code lessons. Uh, I think you had to take uh, 18 words per minute uh, to uh, pass. Uh, I was just about up to uh, 28 words per minute when, uh, when you had to use a typewriter and, uh, and uh, when the court. Overseas, you operated at about 12 words per minute. A word is five characters. Do you dum dum did it die? You learned all about the uh, procedures, etc., etc., etc. Then I was sent to Grenada, Mississippi, and uh, I went home on a delayed uh, route and uh, from uh, Sioux Falls to Grenada, Mississippi. There were 550 members of our radio class, and I thought, boy, if Hitler ever knew the number of people that were, uh, that were uh, ever knew the number of people that were running the guests, and he would certainly give up. Uh, I might say that in pilot training, we were marched across the road in a drizzling storm, and there was a slip Texas mud there. And we were stood up in a big field. We were given a speech by an officer. He said, uh, he, he gave us a words of encouragement, we're be proud, this and that and everything else, sing a lot of songs, and that and everything else, spirit. And he said, I want you to look to a man. He said, uh, I stood where you did about 10 years ago. He says, uh, I'm giving the same speech that the uh, officer gave me. And he said, I want you to look to the man to the right, to the left, to the front, to the rear. And we did. He said, one of those men will be dead in one year from an operational action, even before you see combat. He said, now, if any of you want to quit, just pull over to the side. Well, I think everybody in this nation, uh, in the formation, thousands of us, wanted to pull over to the side, but we were afraid to do so. So he said, OK, from now on, uh, your, your, the Articles of War uh, are in effect, and uh, you're in the, in the pilot training. Well, so may it be. Uh, I uh, feel as if it was one of the defeats of my life when I failed a pilot training. However, uh, when I find that, you know, 71% of the threats washed out, and I was number 69%, why uh, I can't complain. So I went overseas as a radio operator. Now, uh, our class had 550 in there. Every year, every week, they had a graduating class, 350, 400, 500. Ours is extra large. Most of the time, the men were going to Kingman, Arizona, whether they would go to gunnery school, learn to shoot machine guns from airplanes, and then they, from there, they would go home on the furlough, and they'd go overseas to Germany, uh, where they were bombing Germany. And uh, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 planes were being shot down every day over Germany. So we were not optimistic at all. Lo and behold, of the class of 550, that's the other sort of scientific carrier, or uh, 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 transport from an ATC. ATC was a desirable because you flew from the States to overseas. Troop carrier was second desirable uh, because you flew in a theater of operation overseas. Everyone laughed at us because we had no self sealing tanks, we had no machine guns. I was happy because I'm not an aggressive man. I just I owe a lot to you people in here who were in the war. That, uh, that did have to go into combat. I came home in combat fatigue, but it was not a uh, uh, behavioral problem. I came home because of the number of hours I flew overseas, 1,200 hours, and I had over 1,200 hours overseas. So I came home with what they call CF for combat fatigue. Um, at any rate, uh, the, uh, so we were sent to uh, uh, Sudan, uh, Native Mississippi. We were down there 10 days and we were sent to Sudan, Missouri. Uh, as we, on, uh, we flew up. And as we flew up, the uh, C-47s, we lowered to the ground and we stopped the cars underneath us. They were afraid to pass underneath us. Uh, when we landed, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, well, Sudan, so, so Missouri, uh, we had a lot of experiences of men overseas that had been shot down. They escaped through the underground. They first appeared in these mountains in uh, Spain and then been rescued by the British uh, 
was all sunlight, all told secrets, but uh, from Spain they were rescued by the British boats off the coast of Spain. Uh, of course, it usually uh, turned into a bull session. They were explaining uh, to us what they do and what they don't. The first thing you know, they went to about the girls, uh, the opposite sex, etc., etc., etc. So uh, it turned into a bull session. Uh, well, uh, we finished there in uh, June, and uh, there was a big dispute as to whether we should be able to go home or not. Well, we were told we had a, 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 a furlough in uh, January. Well, we, we pointed out this was a leave of a, a transit, and so we got a furlough at home. So we thought, geez, don't tell me that you're uh, waiting, 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 waiting for us because the C-47s were supposed to lead that invasion. Now we got off in Missouri, off the train, and here are the big headlines, invasion of the North Star. Well, the, uh, uh, we had to fill in forms. We, we met our crews at that time, the engineer, the pilot, and the co-pilot. And we had to fill in the form to see our relations in Germany. And I just put that in the room, because that's just the way it was. And uh, so, we were given our plane numbers, which is a four page, three or four letters of, uh, of the, the numbers of the tail. And uh, we were told to open the doors. If there was four, if there was uh, four uh, belly tanks, we were going to Europe. If there were eight, we were going to Pacific. We were told that uh, of the 90 crews going overseas that week, uh, that, uh, that uh, 10 of us would go to the Pacific. Uh, and the others would go to Europe. What was the uh, uh, aspiration to go to Europe, of course? And we opened our door. Our father uh, had a friend that ran a jeep, so we went up and down in a jeep, found our friend, opened the door, eight million times. So that was that. So we flew from uh, Fort Wayne, Indiana, Fairfield, to uh, California, and uh, we were told uh, we were given good food. Of course, we knew we were going overseas. And here we got a new engineer. Uh, Kruger, the uh, engineer who uh, was supposed to go, his father came sick. So uh, I got a fellow by name, McDonald. McDonald had been a sergeant. He had been broken because he had trouble with a woman. He had gotten drunk. And he was uh, broken uh, to a private. So I was a corporal. So they handed me the orders. And McDonald, he could never get over that. Well, at any rate, uh, we took off, and if you remember during the 30s, there were several engineering feats. Most Hoover Dam, Grand Coulee, and the San Francisco Bridge. Well, we uh, I, I, uh, uh, were supposed to take off, and I was supposed, as a radio operator, I was supposed to uh, listen to my call signal. And uh, we took off about two minutes late. I'm pretty sure you know I'm listening. I was supposed to monitor the uh, tower frequency, and uh, I thought, I'll change a little bit. I'm going to listen to my signal. And I heard this number coming across, and I said, holy smokes, that's me. By the time I got my radio set heated up, why, well, uh, they called again. And they told me that they would call me five minutes after the hour, all the way uh, halfway across the Pacific to Hawaii. Well, I uh, gave my call back. And uh, uh, okay, we had a uh, captain aboard. He was a navigator, and uh, he and I got along very, very nicely. Got along very nicely. He showed me how to shoot the stars, and about, he shoot the stars about ten minutes before the hour, and then five minutes after the hour, Point Reyes would call me, and uh, California, right north of California, and uh, they would ask me my position, and I would put it in code, and I'd send my position. About uh, halfway across the Pacific, uh, they, uh, they uh, transferred me to Hawaii. So Hawaii called, and I would transfer that. The Diamond Head is Mount Sinai And I was very disappointed. Uh, from the sea, it looks like a big rock. From the air, it looks like a big rock. It was a big volcano. Uh, a couple of years ago, uh, my wife and I went to Hawaii. And we went up through some of those very tunnels and gun turrets. Uh, you had to buy 
I had, I mean, your first time in head, on an odd number of days you flew counterclockwise, and even number of days you flew counterclockwise to show that you were a friend uh, of that. So uh, every gun in Diamond Head was on you, and uh, we flew the correct way. And uh, a couple of years ago, my wife and I were in there Diamond Head, and we went through those tunnels, and all the guns had been taken out. And uh, I'm glad to say that my son and daughter-in-law, they went through the very same tunnels after we did. So uh, I was uh, glad to see that. Incidentally, my son and daughter, they just came back from the Grand Canyon, Mount Whitney, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, my wife and I have been down the Grand Canyon a couple times. And my son and one son and I, we crossed it over and back in two and a half, two and a half days, 45 miles, and we grabbed it down the Grand Canyon for two weeks. So I was glad that my son and his wife and the two sons uh, did the same thing. Well, at any rate, uh, here uh, we know soon we're taking off from San Francisco. Um, and I was looking over the bridges through the clouds when the uh, pilot said to the engineer, go back and make sure everything's okay. So here he came running up and said, we have a leak. Here from the forward gas tank, uh, there was a stocking about 18 inches high and uh, of gas shooting up. Well, we didn't know what to do uh, to uh, circle out over the ocean at full rich mixture for umpteen hours using the gas. We didn't want to do that. So we went to a lower altitude and we used all the gas in that tank and switched the valves, turned the valves, and uh, we, uh, first thing you know, the fountain went down to just a couple inches and that was it. Uh, when we, uh, that was fortunate, really, because when we were in Honolulu, I was given a strict order not to use any radio equipment, of course. Um, uh, we uh, we in Honolulu, and of course, uh, uh, we spent a couple extra days there getting in the gas tank. From uh, Honolulu, we went down to uh, Christmas Island, and I uh, had another son who, uh, a couple of years ago, he uh, was setting uh, sulfur in the atmosphere. Uh, he went in Christmas Island, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And he, uh, <coughs> but we know soon we're going to take it off from the Hamu when uh, the pilot said to go back and check the gas tank. Here we had a leak, but uh, a wrench uh, tightened it up and the leak stopped. That was it. Well, eventually we ended up in Townsville, Australia. Uh, in Townsville, Australia, uh, somehow or another they lost our orders. And, uh, we have soon found out that uh, if we got up early in the morning, I think the report for breakfast, you get appointed at any of the duties. So uh, at 10 o'clock, the Red Cross truck would come along with sandwiches. We'd be there for the Red Cross truck. We went to town, and uh, they had these huge uh, termite mounds there. And uh, so after, uh, oh, about five or six weeks, we ran out of money. and. Uh, in the uh, Townsville, which is an old country town in Northern Australia. And uh, eventually the pilot, he made me crew. And so we flew as a passenger to Fort Murphy and then to uh, the Hebrides. In the Hebrides, we got a signed outfit. Uh, I was in a darn good outfit during the war. I was in a darn good outfit. Uh, the guys had been overseas 18 months. They were sick and tired of it. And they Welcome McDonald and myself and his fellow brothers. And uh, about a half an hour after I got in the outfit, one of the men came over and she said, By the way, Corporal, I want to tell you something. You don't steal. I said, Boy, that's great news. He said, You can leave your law underneath your pillow. Everyone knows when you go to the shower, your law is under the pillow, and you'll find it there when you come back. So that was great news. I also found out that we had an excellent ground crews. Uh, I was at the listed man, and I was entitled to wear wings because we were an airman. And I soon found out that we had such excellent crew in the ground crew in, that every, every, all the enlisted men took their wings off just so they didn't embarrass the uh, ground crew. In. And so I took mine off. Uh, McDonald, he uh, left his on. He was known as Wings McDonald. And, <laughs> and that was it. 
but uh, uh, I took mine off. I put them on again when I went to a rest league in Australia, uh, et cetera, et cetera. But up in the islands, I took mine off. Well, I cut the record of uh, all my flights. The unfortunate is I didn't put down enough. Uh, uh, I didn't put down enough information about each one. We need the first. Our outfit was one of the first or thirteenth, and our symbol was a, an old Airy Eight, an old boulder. And you know what uh, old boulders think of women. And uh, so there's it. And of course, there's the old boulder uh, in the operation. And, and uh, oh, I got an air medal. Uh, when we flew, we fly from, I'll put it this way, in a pursuit plane, a, a fighter plane goes up, does come back, lands at the same base. A bomber goes out, drops his bombs, lands at the same base. We were different. C-47, um, cargo, C-47, the old DC-3. Uh, we carried about five times, five and a half times, maybe six times of freight. Very, very small compared to today. But when we would fly, we had to go out for 50 hours, and we, uh, 50 to 60 hours. So we were from A to B to C to D to E to F. And that meant we got no mail. That meant that we had to eat on the plane, sleep on the plane, and it would take five or six, seven times, seven or eight days to go out and, uh, and uh, get our 50 to 60 hours on. The 60 hours, 50 to 60 hours, we come back to base. Uh, we were given a day off, and then the uh, plane would be inspected, uh, and then the, the other crew would take out for 50 or 60 hours. And then they would fly 50, 60 hours. In the meantime, we just sat around and got fat and uh, got lazy. And uh, that was it. And uh, then uh, we, we, would, we, we knew about when we would go out because we, uh, every night there was a, uh, on the bulletin board, you looked over uh, uh, who was going to fly the next day. And you knew when, when your plane was in and it was being inspected and the inspection was over, uh, you know that we were going to go out, so that was it. I had many interesting uh, experiences overseas. I saw volcanoes. I saw. Uh, I, I learned a lot from uh, that you only find in the National Geographic magazine. Uh, I, I learned a lot. I saw a lot of volcanoes. Uh, I saw the tides in the Pacific. I was on Australia, uh, Sydney, Australia, on the south. And uh, I went up through the 13th Air Force, which in the Solomons, Guadalcanal, Admiralty, uh, New Guinea, then to Moratown, and then to uh, the Philippine Islands. And I flew on Ari. I was on every island in the Philippines except Negroes. And I flew over Negroes many times. Uh, my next, my next and last flight, oh boy, uh, when they dropped the atomic bomb, uh, we were happy. In the Pacific, we were we had the slogan of uh, Golden Gate 48, Red Line 59, and uh, 49, because we had been in depression during uh, the 30s, and everyone expected a return of the depression, and so we were very very pessimistic in uh, the Pacific. And when I came home, I wrote a lot of letters to my parents, and I was so disgusted with them. Unfortunately, I threw most of them away. Uh, my mother kept them all, uh, and a uh, big mistake, I threw them, threw them away. I still have a few of them left, uh, and uh, it's in uh, my book, but the, uh, <clears throat> on Valentine's Day, we flew into a grill field on Cebu. Cebu had been in yet, and uh, the uh, natives had an, had an army, and they built they had a big cornfield by the sea, and they, they had cleared this cornfield, and they built fires at each end to show which way the smoke was landing, uh, blowing, so we could land against the wind. And uh, here uh, we were flying in a, uh, a, uh, a jeep, and uh, as they were bouncing the jeep around, <coughs> the tail was blue. Everyone hit the dirt, thought the Japanese were coming in on us. As it turned out, Everyone 
going embarrassing. They got up, and it was just a tail wheel. Well, they had to ready over to the main aisle on a lady to get a new tail wheel in, uh, which couldn't be delivered until the next day. The Filipinos are so glad to see us. They, uh, they uh, killed a calf, uh, a, a caribou, they had fresh meat. Uh, they signed our bills. Uh, they did, and we gave them all our extra ammunition and our extra guns because they, they had good use for it. And, uh, and uh, the next day we flew in and uh, we were flying over the lines in the early hours in the morning about 5 30. And all of a sudden the plane started weaving all over the sky. I went up to the pilot and said, What's the trouble? She's looked down there and she said, The Indian sparks are going the wrong way. And they're shooting uh, uh, tracer bullets up at us. And the guys in the back said it was lit like daylight. Well, before we had a chance to get scared, uh, we were out of range, so that was that. I was in one accident overseas. We were coming in for a landing. Fortunately, it was very uh, slow. We had full throttle, and we had the full flaps. And we didn't know it, but the right tail, uh, right uh, uh, tire froze, right wheel froze. And uh, as we landed, of course, we spun around. Uh, it had been another five inches, we would have been a flamer. And as it was, it, we just spun around, and of course, it stalled out the engine. Well, I was a, uh, I had a premonition of disaster. And on the C-47, uh, the radio compartment, if, if you were in an accident and the, and the door jammed, you were stuck. So I got over to the navigator's table, and I sat there, and, as the plane spun around, I'm held all tight, all tight, all tight. And uh, I got off the plane. I went into the back. And we had empty gas tanks or drop tanks and a couple of passengers. And they were thrown all over. And uh, so I got off the plane. I put the shocks in the uh, controls. Shocks are controls that prevent the air from blowing the uh, uh, controls about. I put them in uh, place, and I signaled to the pilots, all was clear. And all of a sudden, I saw coming down the runway, fire engines, ambulances, and then the special seat, all kinds of stuff, and my knees turned apart. And uh, I was in shock. I had leaned it against the, the elevator to uh, to uh, uh, pull it over. Well, eventually I recovered. I got aboard the plane, I called the tower, and I told them we were and the tow truck down and pulled us off because we were blocking the runway and other planes couldn't land. That was only more time. Uh, let's see. Are there any questions? Or, oh, uh, eventually, uh, oh, I got one other story to tell you. Uh, the last flight, next to the last flight, actually, uh, was we were the fly to the Manila. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, we weren't supposed to come back until we put 50 or 60 hours on the plane. Uh, Nielsen Field was on the south end of the Manila. Clark Field was about 50 miles to the north. And uh, here the great big C-54s uh, were coming in with prisoners of war from Japan. And they were landing at Clark Field. And then they were emaciated. They were soft and dysentery. Uh, they were very quiet. They were very, very humble. And uh, we would put them on our smaller planes and take them to Nielsen, 50 miles away, uh, 30 minutes. And if we did one load a day, uh, how the heck did we get 40, 50 hours on? So uh, sometimes we had two or three flights a day. So finally, Lieutenant Ann came in and said, we've got great news for you. We're flying an MV outfit to uh, Okinawa. Well, uh, finally, we're getting some time on it. We flew to Okinawa, and he came back with the good news. We're flying them on to Japan the next day. So we flew them into Japan, and uh, boy, oh boy, it had been the aspiration of every airman in the Pacific to flush a toilet over the Emperor's palace. But, uh, uh, you know, <laughs> uh, the, uh, uh, when the time came, we, we missed a view. So we saw the Emperor's palace over there, and we dove down, went right over the moat, right over the wall, and there's the Emperor's Palace about 100, 150 feet away. With two heavy engines, he knew we had arrived. Well, we called the, uh, uh, the train tracks out to the airport. Now, I suppose I'll know the MPs, the military police, 
take off immediately. Are you kidding? So we put our plane in a position and then disappeared. And so the next plane blocked us in, the next plane blocked them in, the next plane blocked them in. And by the time we got back a few hours later, uh, we, uh, uh, it was too late to leave. So we thought, well, we're going to Tokyo. And uh, we uh, got to find behind the two sergeants. The other sergeant and I got between it, behind the two lieutenants. We thought we were going to be stopped, and, uh, but they were saluted, and we walked right behind them, right across the street to the railroad station. And uh, we counted uh, the railroad stations into Tokyo, it was 18 of them. And uh, there we uh, ordered a meal at the uh, uh, Imperial Hotel, which was Frank, built by Frank Lloyd right after the uh, earthquake of 27. We went to a department store, which was partly bombed out, and had very big Japanese paratroop signs uh, in Siberia. Uh, yeah, everything was made of glass, wood, uh, and there was nothing, or glass uh, or wood, not of paper, nothing made of metal. And um, uh, we, we had a good time. Well, by the time we left Tokyo, evening, oh, the nearest thing, the highest thing in the burnout area of Kentucky were safe. You could tell where all the, uh, the uh, Offices of all the stores were on the safes. They're about as high as this thing right here. And you know, here's a safe, here's a safe. And it was just burned all burned out. Well, we, uh, we, uh, we uh, decided to uh, go back. We didn't want to be in Tokyo at dark. We back to the railroad station, which had been bombed out. And here there was no train going where we came. So finally, Japanese told us of another place, about a mile from where we were going. So we hopped that train, and we got out, and we were going to walk across the airfield about a mile away. The heavens opened up. The jeep came along, we hopped on the jeep, and we got up on our plane or something like that, which was often the case for all the stuff on our planes. Uh, the, uh, the, uh, Went back to Okinawa. Oh, we went down. The kid, instead of going back to Okinawa directly, we went down to Korea, the big Japanese naval base, saw the Japanese fleet sunk. Then we flew over Hiroshima. Uh, we came in from the north, and uh, on this side of the hill, it was all vegetation. On this side of the hill, on Hiroshima's side, it was all burned out. The air tracks went around. And uh, several Hiroshima several times. and. Uh, I've been here seen it several times. Uh, then we went down to Kyushu, the southern island, and uh, gas up and then flew down to uh, Okinawa. Only to be told, hey, take another gang of Van Fees back. So I went to make a second trip to uh, And uh, this time we decided to take another ride in Tokyo. But it was illegal. So we couldn't very well go from that airport. So we flew to another airport and stopped. It got in the pop. It, and wingtip. Well, we flew with a shirt off of a broken wingtip, flew to another airport uh, a few miles away. Well, uh, Spec C 47 had a wingtip, and uh, we got that changed. And uh, all in all, we, we went to Tokyo, but we never saw it as much as that. My wife was at my daughter, was in, my water was in, what is it? One of them is a geologist in the state of Washington. She was in that Japan uh, about December, November, December. She was in China about, uh, about a month ago, after the earthquake in China, and she saw that fault there uh, in China. Well, at any rate, uh, uh, so may it be. Uh, we came back, and there were the orders to be sent home, uh, relieved of flying duty, and my name was on the list. Then they had a, uh, uh, that was supposed to be our last flight. Well, then they had a typhoon that went from the Philippines to Okinawa. So all the tents were destroyed going to Okinawa. So we were put back on flying pad, and we flew up to Okinawa. And uh, a lot of the guys didn't want to fly, but uh, they were his orders. 
and uh, I flew, and one of my longest transmissions to the radio operator was on the way back. They wanted the name of every person aboard that plane, and so I had to do that. And then uh, I was then, well, we went to a transit camp, and uh, Celentino was from the same outfit. The, the outfit was breaking up, breaking up rapidly, and uh, the feeling was that the maintenance was not as good as it had been because we had great guys in our outfit. The propeller men, machinists, they were great guys. And um, the, uh, so uh, we went to transit camp and there were 17 of us and 13 of them had uh, orders. And then there was three of us at CF. So we asked what the CF combat is. So we thought, oh, we're going to get a special priority. Are you kidding? There were th uh, 900 and some on board that ship, and, uh, and we were the last ones to be called on. I had a fever the night before. I, I don't drink coffee, but I drank coffee that night. On uh, my air mattress, I had a sweat about 3 o'clock in the morning, but I was going to make that ship. 31 days on the ocean, over in San Francisco, and uh, all over the sides, all over the hills. Uh, well done, welcome home, well done, welcome home. And uh, then we were sent to the fortnight and uh, given uh, all the food we want, and all the milk we want, all the fresh fruits and vegetables we want. And, uh, and uh, that was it. On, the, uh, on uh, Christmas night, my, uh, a lot of the guys got drunk in San Francisco. I went back about 3 o'clock in the morning. And uh, uh, about 3 o'clock in the morning to my barracks. Ladies were coming down uh, about 10 o'clock in the morning with uh, gifts for the soldiers. I got the gift and born in the station yard. And uh, that was it. I uh, got aboard a trip train and uh, I got home. Uh, uh, I got into a uh, hook on uh, about 11.30. Uh, they pulled the Chicago freight yard. New Year's Eve. And the question is, how soon is the train going to pull out? Well, guys got off the train, and they were ready to get back on straight further and further. At uh, 12 o'clock midnight, I went on guard duty, and the uh, officer of the day came on and said, Sergeant, he says, you like fresh eggs? I said, yes, sir. He says, who's just fashioned about with you? So I fashioned uh, up some of my eggs. And, uh, some of the guys, we didn't pull out until about 4 o'clock, 3 or 4 o'clock in the morning. I finally got home on the 4th of uh, uh, January. My father was suffering from a hernia operation uh, at home. And uh, when he was in bed, he was in bed uh, with a cold. I said, Pop, you've been in bed these three years. <laughs> and uh, they were all, all, all was on my side. Well, I decided to go to college. And I became a teacher, and I said, uh, I, these people that served in World War II were not gods. They should not be worshipped, but they should never be forgotten. And, uh, and that's just it. Uh, they never served <coughs> extra time. Four point pain. Cost thirty-two dollars at the time. That was in that money. When I came home, I went to a department store from the Temple. And the guy was selling ballpoint pens for thirteen dollars at a bargain, and uh, now they're giving them away. <laughs> but uh, they never saw a plastic bag, they, they never saw a computer, they never saw uh, an oven, you know. So these people, they really got cheated. They, were men ever able to get to the moon? Yes, we figured about three four hundred years, uh, and you know what has happened. Uh, we used to bicycle all over. Uh, when I was a kid, I bicycled in my senior year from uh, Philadelphia to Rhode Island and back. I slept in dump trucks and hay lofts and spent a lot of But uh, so many things. Well, listen, I've talked enough. How about questions? Uh, who has questions? Yes, please. Okay, the war, after the war, I mean, Japan surrendered. 
Right. The whole issue we're talking about, about back and forth, happened after the surrender. All right. What What was it like walking around in Japan? There were three. There were three kinds of people on the train uh, going from uh, the airport to uh, in, in the Tokyo. There were those who were resentful. In other words, they were sorry they lost the war. Another kind, uh, should we say, were bootleggers. They, they do anything for you. Another kind were neutral. They would be decent to you if you asked them a question, they'd give you a straight answer, but they didn't lick your boots uh, or anything like that. But uh, I know I made eyes at some of the girls on board that train, and they, you know, knew I made you know. I was a 24 years of age. And, uh, and, uh, but that's because I asked one man what he did before the war. He said he had an old automobile agency and he hoped to get it back. Uh, okay. Uh, so, uh, you didn't feel, uh, did you, you didn't feel, uh, insecure? I mean, you didn't, well, feel listen, fear. uh, after, after, uh, I went to, it was in Tokyo. I got a letter from my mother and she said, don't trust the Japanese. Very, very, and I've been in Tokyo, you know what I mean? And uh, she says, don't trust the Japanese, they're very spiteful, this and that, you know, she can't trust you, know. And uh, uh, basically, there's the three kinds of people that I met uh, those who were resentful, those who were neutral, and those who would do anything to help you out. Okay, sir? Yeah. Any other questions? Yes, sir. What kind of training aircraft did you learn in? Uh, I was in the PT-19A. Uh, uh, I had a 100 engine, I think 175 horses, a big Ford size, uh, big, big for a trainer. And uh, uh, see, George Bradley was a Boy Scout friend of mine, and we bicycled over, and he was killed, and that was where I was spinning. And boy, there's four parts. You line your plane up on a north-south road, this is in Texas, on a north-south road, and you go around and you yell out, yeah, uh, in the roads, you know, north, or east, or south. And then on the count of six, you see, you, know, you, see, you kick the opposite, uh, you know, kick the opposite runner, you push your stick forward, and you're supposed to come right out on that on that road, you know, heading ahead. Uh, 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 well, I set a count of eight, I counted the six, and my golly, it turned out just right. I I was ecstatic. And, oh, you're supposed to go up to four or five thousand feet. I went up to about six thousand to make sure I had plenty of room uh, between me and the ground. And holy smokes, it turned out every right. To the right, to the left, I would go out and I saw the old plane with the shutter, you know, and I'd kick the rudder and fall up into a spin, and I'd count the roads, and I was ecstatic. And if it had been for my uh, instructor having colorblind, I'm, I'm sure I would have made it, because he was supposed to wash out to finish to. And he already washed out his two. And now I'm the third guy for another instructor. And he had washed out his two. And uh, so the writing was on the wall. That is a correct statement, sir. That's a correct statement. Um, you never know what might have happened. Uh, so all I can say is I am here. I'm 87 now. And uh, I am here, and uh, goodness knows what might have happened. You are absolutely right, sir. Who oh, else is a good profession? Well, I think, you know, how about your food intake? Yeah, how many of are you live on C and K? <laughs> <laughs> um, it varied highly. Uh, before we go out in flight, we had what you call 10 and 1 rations. Uh, to, uh, um, it was ten men, see, ten and one, ten, uh, ten men for one day, or, or one day, or, uh, one, or ten, uh, one. <laughs> ten men for one day, or uh, ten days for one man, okay? And uh, there was, there came in odd sizes, one, two, three, four, and five. Uh, three and five had bacon in. And we always tried to get the ones with bacon in. Now, the bacon had a lot of salt in it, so I had to soak the salt uh, to, to get it out the night before. 
So we always try to get sweetie and pie. Uh, okay. Um, rations. And uh, so we ate that. Uh, now, I, I had a pretty good engineer. Uh, he's a Jewish fellow, a redhead Jewish fellow. He was uh, uh, socially ostracized, uh, and rightfully so. He was always dirty, he was crummy, and uh, mm -hmm. he was crummy. Uh, and uh, when we went to the Philippine Islands, the, the rations had a lot of crackers in there, very nourishing, but yeah, you know. And uh, so we used to throw them in the jungle over in the beginning. Uh, in the Philippines, we would uh, say to a Filipino family, uh, here's a broom, so we've got the, so we've got the plane. Well, then we would say, where's your family? And we'll just load them up with excess food. And they really appreciate it. They really appreciate it. Uh, and, uh, but we had to do it on the side. Uh, I can remember, I can remember standing in line and, you know, when you left the dining hall, a mess hall in the Philippines, you dumped your food, excess food in the garbage can and you had three other GI cans. I can remember some little Filipino kids saying, hey Joe, they go, in the foyer, you do it. They swept the, the garbage from your from your plate uh, and you glad to get something to eat. Well, of course, we caught on after that. We made sure, an extra piece of bread, please. We made sure we had garbage so that uh, so they get something to eat. You, you, you follow me? I used to ask the Filipinos, how many children do you have? You always got three answers. Uh, five children, uh, three living, two dead. You always got the three answers, uh, the, the complete number of children, the number of living, and the number of dead. You have no idea at all how lucky we are in this country. That's all there is to it. The sanitation, the health, you have no idea at all. Does that answer your question, sir? Uh, who else is a question? Well, thank you very, very much for listening. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Uh, don't